Nigel Whitehead, thank you so much for coming in today to talk to me. You started your engineering career as an apprentice in Rolls-Royce. What inspired you to follow an engineering career? I'd always been interested in making things, whether it was AFIX models or just whittling things with wood in my dad's workshop. Uh, but it was actually a visit to an aircraft factory when I was nine that really inspired me. I thought, what a fantastic idea. People design and make aeroplanes. I'd love to do that. And from that point on, science and maths had relevance. And uh, I was inspired with the whole idea that I could get involved in designing and making, in particular, aeroplanes. Uh, and when I was 17, I wrote to Rolls-Royce and asked them for some advice and help. Uh, I was in Scotland, hence the funny accent. And Rolls-Royce had a big factory in Scotland, so I wrote to them there. And uh, it ended up with a, uh, an apprenticeship and a sponsored place at university. You've become very much part of the global business leader world. Does that feel very far removed from those early days on the factory floor, as it were? In notion, yes, but actually no, because it's just an extension of the things that I was involved in from a very early stage. I was always given context in terms of understanding how I was contributing as an engineer, and therefore getting involved in setting that context, getting involved in creating new programmes, feels like a natural extension, feels like something I've been involved in for a very long time. Your name has come up in conversation as somebody who has a great deal of vision, passion. Do you feel that it's really important to introduce that sense of passion into engineering particularly? Well, yes, and it should really be very easy to do that because engineers solve the problems of the world, whether it's transport or communication, in my case, defence, aerospace, security. Uh, and uh, to be able to communicate those issues, get the issues across to people who are wondering what they're going to do with their lives, there's all sorts of important things that engineers can contribute to. And by showing people that perfectly ordinary people can do these extraordinary jobs, it is in itself quite inspirational. You've advocated some groundbreaking ideas, the idea of big companies sending their managers to companies downstream. Is that making a real difference and is it an opportunity that's being embraced, do you think? I work for a prime contractor, so we integrate and knit together uh, fantastic complex products and, and services. But the reality is that we are only as strong as our entire supply chain. I have some 7,000 suppliers in the UK and to be able to pull together that fantastic offering into, into the marketplace, whether it's in the UK or in the international business, uh, it's important for me to generate strength amongst our suppliers. And strength usually starts with leadership. So yes, we get involved in uh, helping the leadership in our supply chain, in the small businesses and the medium-sized businesses that support us, uh, to generate future business plans, technology plans, and work out how they can contribute to what we actually place into the market. The commercial world, of course, was profoundly affected very adversely by the global economic downturn. Do you feel that that's actually diminished enterprise, diminished creativity, caused people to pause and think, no, I can't take that risk? I think the answer is no. Uh, and in practice, engineers uh, and engineering companies tend to have a, a long-term view and what has happened as a result of various twists and turns, whether it's shocks in the economy or shocks in terms of what's happening in defence and security, it causes engineers to innovate. It causes them to think about how they actually come up with new, innovative and exciting offerings in, in the marketplace. And although it might mean that some companies tighten their belts during those, those periods, in practice, those with a long-term view actually invest. So BA Systems, the company that I'm uh, involved in the management of, has invested in bringing in young people into our business during that period. Uh, we've invested in our technology plan, spending hundreds of millions of pounds each year on new technologies which don't have an immediate impact on our business but are there for uh, our future for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in advance. And although that seems a crazy idea, the reality is that if we're not doing that, then we have no long-term future. I'm hearing calls around the world for investment in global skills, things like engineering, science, technology. Do you feel that enough is being done in terms of collaboration between governments and the private sector? If I look at the UK, I think that uh, we as an engineering community, whether it is in government or the private sector, have really got our minds around the fact that there is a supply issue. 
We look at the demand and we see the demand is actually increasing. We look at the scale of the challenge that we face and we recognise that in the UK there's a whole lot that we can and should do to make that work. In the private sector, clearly with the provision of, uh, of education, uh, in the public sector the provision of, of, of education and uh, being able to make uh, that work uh, where employers are educating and training their employees, where the school system has to dovetail into that is critically important and I think there's a whole lot that we can and should do. In some way the skill system in the UK hasn't been matching supply to demand. The employers haven't had a sufficiently loud voice and lots of people have been trained but the employers have looked at that and said well it doesn't necessarily match our needs. Over the last few years the private and public sector have started to better align those issues and we're starting to spend money on what the employers are actually looking for. My personal view is that until we achieve that alignment, until we can actually match supply to demand, we're still going to end up with a shortfall. There's still a lot to do. You've also spoken passionately about the need to empower individuals. Surely that's something that comes down to individual leadership within a particular company, because it sometimes jars with the need for corporate requirements to be fulfilled. If I look at the motivation of individuals, uh, first and foremost, uh, my employees and the people that I work with in, in the engineering sector come to work wanting to do a great job. And there is a role for leadership in explaining what the context is, explaining what great looks like, and to create a space that allows the engineers and scientists to do a fantastic job. So one of my roles as a leader is to work out what time and space people need to invent new things, to understand the context. I call it letting the dog see the rabbit. Uh, in my case, in defence, it's about letting the engineer see how the end user in the military actually is facing some threats or some issues with relation to how a product works, letting the engineer see that and coming up with solutions so they can help. Uh, so it's about, I think, creating context and environment. But often it means that I have to provide time and money and space for people to do that. We form teams, we create the circumstances to do that. Sometimes special purpose built buildings with all the facilities, all the capabilities around people so they can create and invent in an appropriate way. And consistent with the idea of having a long-term vision, that often means a significant investment over many years or sometimes decades to achieve a capability that is something that we can then be proud of in the home market and the export market. And in terms of challenging stereotypes, presumably you're having to do that all the time now in order to bring people from very different kinds of backgrounds into engineering businesses, businesses that now have huge commercial appeal. A couple of generations ago, people thought about engineers as uh, those who worked in uh, dark and dingy factories with smoke belching out of, out of the top of them. The modern position is that it's a, it's a clean, active environment uh, where uh, essentially people are relying on science and maths to solve their engineering issues. And manufacturing environments are very sophisticated. In fact, they look more like the facilities for brain surgery than they do for, uh, compared with the mental model people had of engineering uh, two, de two, three decades ago. Uh, so we are attracting people into engineering, uh, but we have a job to do, which is to communicate what that really looks like today. And the best way is to open the doors of our factories and let young people see what it actually looks like. We have lots of experience of bringing people into my business on work experience. And you can see the light bulb go on when they realize that it's ordinary people in extraordinary jobs, when they realize, I could do this, I could be qualified to do this, I'm like these people, I could do this sort of job. And then uh, we, we find we can attract anybody into our business. We're oversubscribed in my business for just that reason, because people want to be involved in the exciting creation. It's the miracle of birth, creating new products. And presumably finding those seeds of inspiration is something that you and your fellow managers are trying to do all the time. We do, and in part it's easier for somebody like me because we can show uh, people what it's like to design and build submarines and ships and aeroplanes uh, and get involved in very sophisticated computing and, and cyber work. Uh, and seeing is believing. People realise that it's something that is exi it exists, they can get involved in it. In exactly the same way that when I was nine I went to an aircraft factory and saw aircraft being built, a light goes on inside and you think, I could do this.
BAE Systems 3D printed the recent winning design for the trophy competition for the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. How much do you think groundbreaking technology like 3D printing is making a difference? Uh, it's going to make a huge difference. Being on top of that technology, being on top of that innovation allows engineering companies to offer a whole new range of products and services. Uh, whether it's 3D printing, which in its own way is a fantastic innovation. Uh, from a, a, a green point of view, it allows us only to use the material that we need to use to make the product, rather than starting with a big lump of metal and paring away and throwing out lots of material that we don't actually need to create that end product. It allows us to come up with designs that we'd never conceived of before. Uh, what have been very simple, rugged pieces now look more like intricate bird's wings uh, because we have the ability to actually make them using 3D techniques. So cost is saved, time is saved, uh, the time to market is reduced. So 3D printing is fantastic. But the whole idea of uh, modern big data and data analytics provides engineers with a world of information that allows them to really understand the basis of a design, the basis of how it's manufactured, and the basis of how it's behaving throughout its life. Uh, components or products that actually speak to the engineers that designed them and say, this is my condition, this is, this is how I'm, I'm faring, I'm being used in a way that isn't appropriate, or I'm wearing out faster, I need to be replaced or, or repaired. That sort of information is, is lifeblood to modern engineering. Modern materials that allow us to do fantastic things, operating at nano level or at, at a macro level, doing all sorts of things that we hadn't conceived of before. The, uh, world of opportunity that's available to engineers because of these innovations is allowing us to come up with new products and services, shorter time to market, cheaper products, more capable products. It's a fantastically exciting time to be an engineer. BAE Systems is of course a very powerful advocate for the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. Why do you support it so strongly? Uh, the Queen Elizabeth Prize is an inspirational prize. I like it for many reasons. Our company has decided to, uh, to sponsor it. Um, the principal thing about it is that it's right up there in terms of making a, a really strong statement uh, to all engineers and the world as a whole that engineering is making a difference, that it's out there making changes that make the world a better place. Uh, and uh, even if you just look at those who are shortlisted for it, you can see the impact that they have. You look at the winners and they're, tr they're truly inspirational. Uh, from that perspective, I like the idea of getting into people's minds that engineers are making that fundamental difference. I also like the fact that it reinforces the idea in your mind that something really special is happening where engineers are doing great things and they're being celebrated in that way and it gets into people's consciousness. And going back to the idea of selling engineering as a career, selling the benefits of engineering and therefore getting the support of the public, the Queen Elizabeth Prize is a great iconic way of doing that. Nigel Whitehead, thank you so much. And thank you, it's a pleasure.